and the energy for me has to be right good um, good it's all about the energy isn't it and if, if two energies don't match then you won't get the best for yourself or for the person that you're interviewing hello all welcome back we're in season two this is episode 15 of the inquisitive Brin podcast and i'm shaw your host and today i am really pleased to welcome to the show a lovely, wonderful, and very talented psychic artist, June Eleni Lane. And June Eleni is a published author. She's also an educator. So she holds lots of different workshops, exploring the mysteries of uh, life and death to inspire and empower other people. She has a new e-learning course out, which is a very unique way to handle and deal with all practical journeys with self-realization, spirituality, and learning how to connect with spirit. Juna Lenny is an author as well, so she has two books out. One, The Art of Being Psychic, and two, Mandela, The Art of Creating Future. And these are spirit-inspired and art-directed manifestation works. Juna Lenny received a certification in mediumship at the Spiritualist Association of Great Britain and also she has over 30 years experience in tutoring all over the world and also mainly at the College of Psychic Studies which you know I have a history at both and so we have that in common. She's a reputable spiritual teacher in the UK and throughout the world she has some great workshops coming up and ongoing workshops which you can attend via zoom or you can attend some of them going physically there to the college in london i was looking for someone who does psychic art and i've had psychic art portraits done for me in the past i still have them here but june eleni i immediately i knew uh, i wanted to speak to her and lucky for me she agreed to be interviewed for the podcast. So I'm so happy she's here. Welcome, Juna Lenny. Juna Lenny, lovely That's to it. see you. Thank you so much for coming here and being on the podcast today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's so nice to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I've got loads to ask you about. And the first thing I'm interested in is, how did you know that you were psychic? How did you come to know that you had these gifts? Yeah, that, that's that's a really good question. And um, it's difficult to pinpoint the time, um, but it probably happened the very first time when I was very young at school, um, maybe three and a half or four in infant school. And my school, as, as a lot of schools were up in the Northeast, I'm from the Northeast, were converted... Um, uh, chapels to not the main church but the smaller church and they converted them into schools but of course the graveyard that started you know there when it was used as a chapel was still there so what they did is they they put a fence around it so if you can imagine the school here the graveyard out back then a big fence around it so it couldn't be seen and then the playground so that was kind of the layout. But the but the classrooms in the school were overlooking the graveyard. So when you looked straight out of the window, you could see the graveyard. So my first um my first real experience of, of being very confused, I remember. I remember it distinctly. And I was looking in the direction of my teacher, but really I'm not listening to a word she's saying. I'm off in a daydream, which I often would be as a child. And I was looking out of the window and suddenly I saw something moving around the gravestone, the gravestones. And I was very curious and watched it for a while. And my teacher could see me moving and she said, are you all right? I said, oh, no, I have a question. I thought, may as well ask her. Here's the font of all knowledge in front of me, the teacher. So let me ask her, said, there's something in the graveyard. There's something moving around out there. Um, what is it? So she looks, the whole class look, and she it's nothing. It's your imagination. And in that moment, it literally disappeared in front of my eyes. So the filter was put on mm. at that very early age from, no, that's your imagination. That's not real. You're not supposed to see that. Stop it. Right. 
And I quote, what could I say? You know, this was my teacher. Oh, okay. It was my imagination. And I put it down to imagination for the next two or three years. And then suddenly I saw a book. So that's me about six or seven. And I saw a book. And in the book was the exact picture, depiction, if you like, rather than photograph, depiction of the thing that I saw. And it was titled A Ghost. It was in that moment I thought, hmm, I've seen that. And my teacher told me that that was my imagination. So from that day forward, <laughs> guess what? I didn't pay any attention to what my teacher said. I challenged everything they said, which was a little bit difficult. But, but that was when I started to realise perhaps I could see things that we're not supposed to see because – you know, the lesson came loud and clear. I wasn't supposed to see that. That was my imagination. Wow. So that, that's where it all started, really. And, and, of course, from that, from that understanding that I wasn't supposed to see what I could see, I became frightened. Oh. So I, I then closed down and, and went as far away from anything of that nature as I could for a, for a long, long time. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I started to have experiences that I couldn't explain that got my attention late at night. Voices, the, the, the sense of coming out of my body, being pushed down onto the bed, all, all, the, all the things that you hear people talk about. And I really did think I was going mad. Mm -hmm. And I, I really talked it through with myself because there wasn't anyone else I could talk to about it, I felt. And I thought, you know, do I go and see a doctor? Do I put up with it? How can I make it stop? What's going on? I don't like it. And then out of the blue, a friend that I hadn't seen for about six years turned up on my doorstep. This is very strange. Maybe I could tell him about it. And I felt, yeah, let, let me just explain what's happening. And he said, well, it's so funny you should say that because I'm doing a healing course at the SAGB and I think you should go and talk to someone there about it. Definitely don't go and see a doctor because they will give you medication and shut you down. So why don't you go there? And I thought it gave me the number, gave me the details. I thought, okay, let me go there. So I phoned up and I said, look, you know, I, I'm having some strange experiences that I can't explain. And I was told by a friend who's studying healing with you that you might be able to explain it to me. And they said, well, funnily enough, there is a one of our teachers is doing interviews tonight. Um, you could come in and see her. And they gave me a time and I was there. And um, she was trying to sell me the course. I said, look, I don't want to develop this. I don't want to do a course. All I want to do is make it stop. And she said, well, I can help you to make it stop. I can teach you how to make it stop. I said, okay, sign me up. And that was it. <laughs> Amazing stuff. But, you know, during that time where you were sort of shut down a bit, we would call it shut down a bit, mm -hmm. uh, can you remember if you had any experiences and what home life was like? I um there were lots of experiences, but I disassociated. Okay. I became very good at disassociating. My my mother actually left home when I was four, left my father, and um I went to live with my grandparents. And my grandfather was a very wise man, and I felt very safe with my grandfather, and it kind of made me feel safe. So I didn't have to worry about the funny experiences that I was having. There were more around my mother, who it turns out, of course, is where I get the gifts from. My mother's Egyptian Greek. And yeah, and she she was very, very psychic, but she was never taught how to use it. But we we had a connection that was very interesting and, and strange things would happen all around her like milk bottles would start dancing on the side and doors would slam and things like that. And I just learned to disassociate from it. So it wasn't really until I had that wake up call of, of things happening to me in my twenties that I paid it any attention. Before that, I was just in disassociation. Yes. Interesting though, isn't it? 
very interesting. Although I did pick up a book, I seem to remember, when I was about 12 or 13, and it was a book of psychic things. And there was an exercise that it had you sit on the floor and imagine you were looking at yourself. Can you, can you relate to that being 12 or 13? So I can do this. And I sat down and I was imagining myself looking at myself and suddenly I was out of my body, frightened the life out of me. And that was it. I burnt the book, got rid of it all and stopped it all. Yeah. Because they, I was not willing, shall we say. Of course, but you know, that's okay. That was a protection for you then. And that's what I needed at the time, Shar. It, it really was, yeah. That's what you needed at the time. Because if you had pursued that, it may not have gone so well anyway. Well, who knows? But at least it's given me the experience of what it's like to be afraid. Because obviously when people come to see me, quite often they're nervous. Right. What's going to happen? You know, well, what is it like to connect to the other side? And so that's why I like to take all the mystery out of it or the or the what I call woohoo. Mm -hmm. I don't like the woohoo because I like to have practical skills that we can use in, in practical life. Because we're here. We're here in the physical body. We may be spiritual having a physical experience, but we're actually having or creating, I always say creating this physical experience. So if we've come here to create a physical experience, then we should engage in it, right? And if we can use our sixth sense, for want of a better word, and our intuition to make this practical and make this um, physical experience more practical using spirituality, then surely that's for the betterment of life, no? <laughs> Absolutely, for the betterment of the universe, really. In the yeah. People. Yeah. Such an and as it's a human experience we're yeah. creating, then we need to, you know, embrace the human parts of ourselves and, and make the betterment of humanity. That's the goal. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, yes, so that's interesting. An interesting start there. And then. Yeah, the un, unwilling spiritual. Unwilling, well, <laughs> I don't know, because spirit may have said, okay, she's just not necessarily unwilling, but just not ready. Just yeah, yet. not ready. And that's it, better. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was put on the back burner for just a little bit. Is that then when you went into another thing we have in common, fashion? I was in the fashion. Oh, world. really? You were in fashion too. Oh, so much in common. It's amazing. So, when did you start your career in fashion? Well, I went to university. Um, and I actually started when I was 17. I actually changed my birth certificate so I could get on the course a year early. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so, yeah, so so I went to, to university to study the associateship of the Clothing and Footwear Institute. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do the, the BA fashion design. I decided that because I was brought up by my grandfather, who really was very practical. He was an inventor. He could make anything. He and my father once built a car from a scrapyard and drove it away. I know. It can't happen these days, can it? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's interested or have the time. They just want to. Yeah. Well, they were both engineers. So, yeah. So they did that. So my he was a very practical man, my grandfather. And I used to spend hours in his shed with him learning how to make things. I did woodwork, I did metalwork, I did turning, oh, bricklaying, electrics. I know how to, if you overwind your watch, I know how to take it apart, release the spring, put it back together. <laughs> so yeah, so I've kind of been brought up in a practical household. My grandfather would never throw anything away, go, no, that'll come in useful one day. And sure enough, it would. <laughs> yes. Right. I'm a little bit like that, although I tend not to have the amount of clutter that he had, um, fortunately. Yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> you clutter if you collect. Yeah, that's so not went, good. Yeah, so you went to uni, you got your... Yeah, and I, I got my associateship of the Clothing Institute, and then I came to London, which, of course, in England is the centre of fashion, so I had to come to London to work. So I was in the fashion business for 20 years in, in the West End and in the East End. And yeah. What was that like for you? Well, because it was creative. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was using my psychic ability without realizing it. I just knew sometimes when I could sell something, I knew that that was a bestseller. I knew that I needed to do that. There was like the intuition guiding me. You know, a lot of people ask me, what is intuition? And and I loved that question. It's just an intuition is, and everyone's got their own idea of what intuition is. But the one that I've come to um, nurture and, and, and develop as, as something that I truly do believe intuition is, is the inner tutor. We, we, we just have to listen to the word really, intuition, yeah. the inner tutor. So the inner tutor is the part of us that I think um, brings in all the available information, both physical and spiritual, and makes sense of it so that we can use it. The inner tutor. So we become tutored by our Inner feelings and thoughts, yes. education, ideas, everything. It, it's a holistic thing, the intuition. It isn't just spiritual. It's changing the spiritual into something that we can understand. I think that's the job of the intuition. Because you'll talk to people who are very intuitive and they get all this information that comes into them and they've got no idea how to talk about it. Yeah, Because if you think about it, it comes in through the right side of the brain, which is yeah. the part that's the feeling and connected side to the universe. And then it gets filtered by the left side of the brain, which is the logical naming, labeling. I want to understand. I want to explore. I want to see that. Yeah. Whereas the right brain is more allowing it to come yeah. through. So yeah. we have this allowing energy coming in. And then we have the exploring energy trying to make sense of it. And the intuition is, is the bit where the two meet. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does indeed. It's ingenious. It's good. I like that. The inner tutor. Mm. But when, when we do hypnotherapy, we talk about the left and right side of the brain. And the right side is all about creativity and allowing and just being relaxed about things. It mm. can get you in trouble um, sometimes, you know, the daydreaming, the slogging off um, for a, a work and things like that. But if you use it correctly and channel your creativity correctly or helpfully, I suppose, it can really help you. Yeah. I think we need both, don't we? But I We definitely need, but we need a partnership. We do. We, we can't do. At, at the moment, you know, for many people, the two are fighting. They're in mutual conflict with each other. It's like having two totally different personalities in your own head. Yeah. And I love that, the in, the inner tutor. Speaking of which, you've got a, co a complete whole course and courses that you offer. Now, I do want to, though, talk about uh, this one in particular, the course that what is transversing your timeline? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, what You've is, picked out that intuitively, haven't you? Yes. And also, what do people gain if they want to go on the course? Okay. So um, traversing your timeline was something that was given to me when I did a spirit guide portrait for an Australian art therapist who mostly dealt with children. Mm. And I often um, do spirit portraits, both of loved ones and or spirit guides. It's part of a service that I offer. Um, but when I come to do loved ones, obviously we can get validation. Look, does this look like your mother? Does this look like your father? And then there are photographs as evidence of that validation. So once you're, as a spirit artist, you're doing loved ones, um, that is the part that gets the validation. Once you have that validation, so if you come and, and, and do a course with me where I'm teaching you to do spirit portraits, I normally only let people that are beginners go for the loved ones because oh. otherwise a spirit guide could be just, again, a fairy story, right, which is sometimes helpful. Again, I'm not knocking fairy stories. They, they're useful in certain cases. But because I like to work from a, a validation point of view, so it's practical, um, I will not let new students generally do more than one spirit guide just so they can feel the difference. Exactly. What's the difference in energy between a loved one and a spiritual guide? So I, I was doing this session for a spirit guide who turned out to be or claimed to be Leonardo da Vinci. Hmm. 
Mm. Well, as an art therapist, that must have been such an exciting experience for her. And all the information that he gave fit her situation. Some of it was very personal. And generally, that was that. I'd close the, the Zoom and or the Skype as it was at the time. And I wouldn't think any more about it because it's too much. You know, it, it's too much. But I think I was a little bit in awe of the fact that he was claiming to be Leonardo da Vinci. And because I'm a skeptic, you know, we, we we had a chat about that. And and I do like to have validation because I, I'm not one of these people that just believe everything that comes my way. Not You know, it needs to come to me in three different ways before I'll actually take it on board. So three is the magic number for me. And um, this spirit guide... Um, suddenly seemed to still be there. Oh, are you still here? Yeah, what do you want? Oh, this is going to be fun. And I went, no, 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 I have a question. Okay, are you really the Leonardo da Vinci that lived in the 1400s? And the answer I got was most disappointing. It was, well, no, it doesn't work the way you think it works. Reincarnation doesn't work the way you all think it works on that planet. Um, okay so I remember having a mixed feeling of disappointment because I really figured that I knew what reincarnation was back then and excitement that okay let me let go of the box that I've put reincarnation in and open it up to new possibilities so that that's where that started and I did work with him for years after that and he it was like drip feeding me information um in a way and in another way it was as if he got a big jigsaw puzzle threw it on the table and said there you go put it together with no picture Ooh. so sometimes I'd try and force the pieces in how does this fit together and sometimes I'd just give up and wait for the piece to show itself where it fit so this was a process of being able to traverse timeline in a way that's not in a child's work it's not hypnotherapy. It's not family constellations. It's not having a time machine and taking the physical body back. It's none of those things. What it is, is learning how to remote view and remote influence. Excellent. As they did with the CIA yes. during the Cold yes. War. And, yeah, and, and, and to actually use that to visit yourself. Right. OK, and then learn how to receive that information and learn how to give that information. Yes. OK, good, 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 good. Yeah. So that's what it is. So what we do is we take people back to their childhood, often to events that have shaped their lives. There's a whole process of how we get to the four cornerstones that shaped your life. There are always four events that shape your personality, what you do and how you how your subconscious has you act when you're not paying attention. Yeah. the old patterns, the old habits. And we help to gently um, erase those and replace them with more helpful habits. And if they are um, things that are, are useful, but not as habits, just to use them by choice, we nurture those, keep those, put those in the toolbox. And then what, what we're doing is we're educating ourselves so that our future self knows how to do exactly all of these things so guess what the future self comes back into the now in the way that we've gone back to our child in order to help us so this is a process of self-empowerment yeah. and time travel kind of without taking the physical body obviously yeah so it's more than just a psychic course this is oh totally this is part of my e-learning course yes. yeah which, which starts off teaching all the fundamentals about how you would need to have oh, mediumship right. okay. because you need to be able to have that mediumship ability to converse with yourself in another timeline brilliant and that brings me to your thoughts i'd like to know your thoughts because that's a brilliant course on the issue of two things. One, is everybody psychic? And two, is everybody a medium? Okay, great questions. <laughs> you are so inquisitive. Well, I like inquisitive ask, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I love do. it, Sha. <laughs> I 
love the, I yeah. love to ask mediums and psychics these questions because we can ask other people, but is it, but you know what you're talking about. So yeah, and there's a difference between a psychic and a medium. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I believe difference. so, but I've been oh, to yeah. the prison. Okay. What are your thoughts? So, so well, which, which question? The psychic and the medium? Whatever you want to start. Medium, it, um, are psychics... Is everybody psychic? Let's start with that one. And I'll give a metaphor that I always give about that one. So can everybody go to the gym? Right. Right. So, yeah, we can all go to the gym. Yes, we're all psychic. Are some people better in the gym than others? Yes. And why? Because they practice or they do something in their life that helps them to be able to do what they do in the gym. So if you're carrying a lot of weight in your work, then you're going to be able to lift more weight in the gym. So if you're doing things in your work that relate to what it is to be psychic, which is using your sixth sense, so you're coming from a place of, of the non-physical where you're actually reading energy, for want of a better word, you know, the universe is made up of 99.9% .9 energy. So if we're reading energy, that opens up the world away from just this earth into an energy that's connected to the oneness of everything. So potentially it's connected to the wisdom of, of everything that humanity has ever learned and known throughout its existence. So that's the potential of what we've got coming through the right brain. But because the right brain hasn't got any language centers or very few like a child, we know things that we can't explain. How many times is it that you, I just know, how do you know? I don't know, but I just know. And then it turns out to be true. Okay, but what do you say to people? Because I can hear our listeners and viewers now thinking, well, I believe in intuition. So we've got intuition. But, you know, psychic. Mm. Yeah, well, well, you know, if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you're still right. Yeah. So it, it's very much about what you focus on becomes bigger. You know, that it, it, it reminds me of the story of the two wolves, you know, the, the ancient um, Native American Indian story. At least that's where it's supposed to come from, where the grandfather is talking to the grandchildren and saying, you know, every man, woman and child in the world has got these two wolves in its head. One is love and one is fear. Mm. And the children are oh, and they fight and they fight and they argue. OK, you get the metaphor. And one of the grandchildren says, but grandfather, which wolf will win? And the grandfather says, the one that you feed. Mm, yeah. Fantastic story. Love that. Yeah. So, so it's the one that you feed. So if you believe that you don't have psychic ability, you will probably end up shutting it down. Yeah. And that's OK, because maybe you don't need it. But then something might happen like it did with me. And some experience that you just can't explain with your logical mind. And then that opens you up. And then another experience happens and another experience and another experience because that's what you're focusing on. So, yeah, we all have psychic ability. We all could become mediums, just like we can all go to the gym and we all potentially could become weightlifters. But very few of us want to be weightlifters and not very many people want to be mediums. Yes. Okay. So there we go. That's the second part of the question. Is everybody a medium? And you're saying same applies. If you want to be a medium and you practice, you can. Yeah. I, I, I believe that it takes practice, but I, I'm going to do some research. I'm, I'm in the process of researching this. Ruthie Phillips, who I interviewed on, who's a very good friend of mine, I interviewed on the show. She's a clairvoyant medium. We were talking a bit about the issue of can can all can everybody be a medium my belief is i believe everybody's psychic um but uh, the jury's still out for me about mediumship well that's um, nature or nurture and is it some of each well it may be and and i think we need more research the trouble is nobody wants to do this work and research it but Right. So the skeptics have done their bit, um, which I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about in a second just quickly. But I think lineage, we were talking about that as well. There is some evidence out there about lineage and that it may be connected to that. I mean, yeah. you've, you've got roots in that. Me too. I'm sort of third generation psychic. So it, it, it can be there. Ruthie had Romani 
you know but, uh, but that's the same with the gym in genetics you you can have the type of body that best works in a gym exactly. it's, it's, it's i think it's both nature and nurture yes, yes. and rusi gave a similar example of uh, swimming you know mm. every, but some people are just good swimmers and some aren't and yeah. if you practice more you could yeah but for so that will be helpful i think everything that you've just said about that because but isn't that the same in all aspects of life? You know, some people just seem to be gifted at singing and some people have to work really hard to get there. Well, that that is what feeds into my belief about I'm not too sure. And that's just my belief that everybody can be a medium. And I don't know if it's a choice. I And this is about creativity. I believe some people are born with i mean we take beethoven we have the geniuses out there how can you be age three and play a complete concerto i i don't know you never had a lesson you had to be born with that and through my years of mediumship and connecting with so many different entities i'm sure you've had the same spirits who've passed over is that <laughs> i'm thinking of a particular musician i um brought through through no choice of my own but I suppose we do have a choice but who said look I was born with this I didn't you know so that fed into my belief anyway that mm -hmm. oh okay I was thinking that anyway so yes uh, uh, but I think for our viewers our listeners out there those who listen to a podcast on spirituality um, because you know I have several different bits to the podcast You'll be asking about the physicality of mediumship or the validation. So can you talk a little bit about the part where people are unsure, that may be skeptic? Um, I'm a critical thinker. I've always have been. Um, it's just in my nature, I believe, which is why I am so inquisitive. <laughs> I'm always asking, mm -hmm. how, but why? And can it be done another way? And, you know, what evidence do we have? <laughs> it's my favorite question. The, the thing about, about mediumship, skepticism? yeah, the thing about mediumship is that the evidence is always anecdotal because right. that's all we've got. Yeah. We, there, there, is, there is no real evidence, which is why the skeptics have a field day with it. And I think to put it on the chopping board in that way, harshly said but the metaphor is there to put it on the, the the chopping board of it having to be subjective when it isn't no objective when it isn't it's subjective it's not objective the reason it's not objective is because it doesn't belong in this physical realm so we we like objectivity because we're here to experience objectivity we're not here to experience spiritual if we were, we would be in the place where it was spiritual. We're here to experience the physical, right? And we need to embrace the physical. And a lot of people are not even happy to be in the physical. They'd much rather sky jet off and be in the spiritual. And sometimes they live their whole physical lives in the, in the spiritual. And I wondered to myself, if when they finally do go home, wherever home is, they think, I just wasted that physical experience absolutely you know because because we're here in the physical so it's good to make the most of it that the one thing that's missing i, I i'm often told this by spirit yeah. people that come the one thing that's missing on the other side is a physical experience that's the only thing that's missing they've got everything else yeah. you know the the love the, the expanse the 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 abilities to do things beyond the physical is all there but the thing that they don't have is the separation yes they don't have that they don't have the physical experience which is why we have a planet with millions of spiritual souls in a physical body all wanting to have this physical experience but just wanting to create this experience your mental health is a priority. Nine Pitches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now. Be it confidence, positivity, 
restful sleep or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. But just going back to the skepticism, just so that we're clear for our audience out there, mm -hmm. why do you think that people find it difficult to, um, I, don't, I don't know, believe is the word, but to fathom the idea that there could be something to this? Well, it's the age-old question as well of religion, isn't there? You know, where where is God? Why why must we believe that there's something that we call God that we can't see? And and what is that? And why is it there? But Are you everyone because they can't see it. Are you saying because they can't see it? That's because they can't see it. It's not objective. So therefore, what's left is just to believe. You know, we could say, well, we can't see the wind but we can see the results of the wind. So what would you say then to someone who you're giving a reading yeah. and you're, you're told you, you have nothing, let's say, have you done public demonstrations? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay, so you know, <laughs> they're like, I wanna go to the lady second row with the red coat kind of thing. Well, it's different for me because I, I produce a picture and then somebody puts oh, their hand up and says, hey, that's my father. Good. Okay, that's a good de good um, separation there. So with psychic art, you've got the evidence. So you've got yes, something you objective. Know. You're bringing something through that that then produces something objective that they can look at and say yes or no. Right. So that makes a big difference. Which is huge kind of difference. Getting that here about the evidence. We want to talk about evidential mediumship. You're a psychic artist. How does that work for you? How does it come through for you? I'm not sure how it works, although I have a theory, but I know how to make it work. So how I make it work is through intention. Energy work is always done on intention. Firstly, intention, and then the physical follows. So I make an intention to connect with someone's loved one in spirit, and I will start to draw automatically. I don't see them, and I have never seen them before, so... I've got no way of being able to draw them through memory seeing. So I'm literally having with memory seeing is where I'm inspired by something and then I try to draw what I see. So because I'm not an artist, so I literally allow it to happen automatically. And when I'm teaching my students how to do that, I go into feel the energy of allowing and then feel the energy of exploring, allowing and exploring, allowing and exploring. And it, it was very interesting because the left brain, of course, wants to to organize it and make sure. And it, and if you're if you're not quite getting it right, the left brain wants to put it right. So we have to find ways of making the right brain more dominant, which I have a few ways that I teach my students as well. And then we we start. So that the most extraordinary one that I can give you an example of was one that I was doing at the college. A German man had come to see me, especially from Germany, been um, recommended to see me. And I started to draw and I got an idea that that this was his son. I said, okay, your son is in spirit past, very young. Yes, yes, this is who I've come. Okay, lovely. And I've started to draw and, and I'm saying to him, can you recognize him? Yes, yes, it's very good. And I'm looking at my drawing and my left brain's going crazy because this boy has got Chinese eyes. And this is a German man. So my left brain's going, and my left brain going, no, no, you've made a mistake. It must be a spirit guide. No, no, I've actually intended for the son. 
this is who it is. I, I, and I'm, I keep saying to him, are you sure that you can recognize him? He's going, yes, yes. And still in my mind, I think he's just being kind. Okay. And then in the end, I finish it and I'm so tempted to change the eyes, but I don't. And I hand it across to him and he looks at it and he cries. And he said, my wife is Chinese. So then you start to realize you really need to get out of the way. Otherwise, you really will adjust and, and adjust and try to correct. They call it the analytical overlay, you know, in, in the remote viewing world. Can anyone who is psychic do psychic art? Well, yeah, with the right techniques. And that's what my e-learning course is about. That's what I'm getting at. The the all the war techniques, right? Like which I've developed, you know. I, I had some a couple of lessons. I was very fortunate in that my um the time that I was learning to do spirit portraiture, Coral Polge was still alive. Oh. Yeah, and she took an interest in my work and helped me and gave me a few pointers, even down to the colours that I should use you know, to get the best results, the, all the, the different tones of all the different flesh colours and that I should use hairspray to fix them because it smelt nicer. So all little tips that I got from Coral. And then unfortunately when she fell and she was in hospital, she actually asked if I would take over and do her demonstrations for her. Yes. So I did. I, I worked with a medium that she worked with, which was Bill Landis, and he was just superb. Bill Landis. The amazing medium. Oh, was funny. And probably one of the only mediums that I know who had true clairvoyant vision. Wow. College of Psychic Studies. Oh, she was, at college, right? she was yeah. also at Pembridge Place a lot. At Pembridge a lot, yes, yes, yes. Right, Amazing right. woman. Oh, my goodness. You know, to be in her presence was quite something. Yeah. Um, and she brought through the, the system where the chakras are, they start at the centre, they go to the left side of the body and they come back to centre. So this this I've come to regard as the system of the left-hand path. So this is very different from the chakras that come up the yes. centre that we use in yoga. So this is specifically for psychic development. So, so the e-learning course is something I launched in January and it's got eight different modules. The first three are all the basics. It includes the chakras. It includes the right and left brain. It, it includes all, all the basic tools that you need in order to start your journey towards mediumship or psychic ability or even just using your intuition better in work and play um, and in relationship. There's a lot of work in relationship. So the first three modules are the basics. And then from then, you can choose four, five, six, seven, eight. And they all have different functions. Some of them are dream interpretation, using masks um, from, the, from the perspective of creating energy within a mask to help you to do things, exploring the difference in relationships. In fact, I, I had some feedback from my Tuesday night class member just this morning saying that she used a relationship graph on one of her clients. She's a therapist already, as I say, I teach teachers. And she used this relationship graph within his therapy and she had a breakthrough. He's been in denial for years and she had a major breakthrough. And she said to me she was crying with joy that this tool was able to affect her client in such a positive way. So there's all of that within the e-learning clause. There's the spirit portraits. There's the traversing the timeline. Um, as I said before, dream interpretation, making masks, doing aura graphs, doing spirit graphs, all, all the different aspects of psychic art within that um, e-learning course. And, and the beauty of it is you can do it in your own time. You know, you don't have to be available wherever you are in the world for a live stream. I mean, some of my Australians get up at three or four in the morning to come and do a live stream with me. It's just incredible. <laughs> the dedication they have. I mean, wow, I'm not sure I'd be doing that. <laughs> There's a teacher for it. So they will go where the teaching is. They'll be drawn. Yeah, them. yeah that's true. What they do. Um. I always like to ask mediums this question. If you could live in any time space, it could be the present, maybe the past. Oh. What, what would it be? If I could live in any time other than this time. Do you know what? 
I think this is the most amazing time to be alive right now. I think we're at the cusp of AI and the possibilities of what's going to happen exponentially from now within the next five to 10 years will be unprecedented. And I think that I have picked this time because I think this is the best time to be alive. Now, if you're asking me about music, no, I would definitely come during the era of the big band sounds. I love big bands. So that I would, you know, um, I would be interested to pay a visit during caveman times, but I wouldn't like to be living there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I think now is the most extraordinary time to be alive. You know, we've got chat, GTP, and all that that's doing, and then the add-ons to that. And then there are, there are artworks that are coming out done by AI, which just are mind-blowing. What the future holds medically with AI, who knows, as surgeons with replacement limbs. You know, I, I have a friend who lost his leg in the London bombings, and you know, I could just imagine that he would be augmented to have a brand new leg, you know, and it just, it's such an exciting time to be alive, I think. It is indeed, yes. I, and I, I'm always fascinated by mediums, you know, responses, because you've had connections with all, you know, different uh, timelines of living, yes. Exactly. Yeah. But in Egypt also, I think that that because my mother was born in Egypt as well, so I have an affinity with Egypt, but I had a um, a spirit guide from ancient Egypt ca came through once once or twice. And um, there's a technique that they taught me that I've called the writings on the wall. And that's another manifestation technique. Um, so I think in ancient Egypt, it must have been fascinating. To, but I don't like, I don't think I'd like to have, lived in that time just to visit you know I like the visits but I think I, I'm enjoying this creating this human experience in this timeline right now. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating what daily practices do you have that help you to stay uh, centered grounded or, or do you have another name for it? I think that's a great question and it's been on my mind a lot just recently because I like the practicalities as well of life. I think it's very important to stay connected. And the first thing that I do when I get up in the morning is make my bed. I think if you can do the small things right, because it's always nice then when you come back to the evening, you may have had a really tiring day and your bed's beautifully made because you've made it. So, and, and, and I've heard that a few people that, that like to keep things in order do that. It, it's not new to me. I, it's something I've picked up along the way. But if you make your bed, and the other thing that I did, especially during lockdown, is I had people write themselves love notes and put the love note under the pillow, especially if you live on your own. Because then when you come to come to bed at night, you've probably forgotten that you've done that and you open the bed and here's a love note from your past self to your future self. How adorable is that? That is adorable. Oh, wow. And it's like, I love you. This too will pass. Everything's going to be okay. Have a good night's sleep. I'm thinking of you now. Any little thing like that. Just... It, Give it a try, you know, if you're listening at home, write yourself a love note because the most important thing you can do is, is to be in love as opposed to be in fear. And I often say to people, you know, I can't teach you, but love will teach you and I can show you how to be in love. <laughs> That's beautiful. And what would you say to anyone who's having a few spiritual experiences and who isn't sure about what to do, what, what they might Yeah, that, that's such a great question. You know, I, I would go to any establishment that, that has a reputation, a long-term reputation. Um, you can also go onto my website. I've got a few ways on my website that you can cleanse, that you can close down. If you feel overwhelmed, what it might be, how to, there's one 
particularly that I love. It's very cathartic, where if you're getting really frustrated and you want to get rid of some of that energy, there's a there's a lovely way of doing it. And that's on my website. You literally draw out all your angst and then you actually do a whole ritualistic burning of it. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So that there are lots of resources out there now. So you don't have to be alone if you're having strange experiences. Just reach out. People are more than happy to help you. And what's next for June Eleni? What's next for me? That's very interesting. I I figured that the e-learning course really is what's going to be taking my attention for a long time going forward. But I do want to add on retreats to that so that people that have booked on the e-learning course will get the opportunity to come on retreat. And so I'm looking for really lovely kind of um, areas and, and locations at the moment. I think my first one will be on Santorini in the Greek island. I have good connections there. So, yeah, I'll be doing retreats there. Maybe there will be some in the UK and other events. I've been invited to Canada and um, I think there will be others in um, Europe. There's certainly one in France I've done before. So I'm looking. I'm, I'm actually looking. So I think that's what's next. Oh, that is exciting. Yeah. I, certainly, I love Santorini. I would certainly be there. It's got such a lovely energy, doesn't it? Yeah. June Eleni, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Shah. You're so lovely to talk to. You're doing a great job. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, you've given us so much to think about, to learn about, and your courses sound amazing. Now, listeners, all the links will be in the show notes. And also go and follow June and Lenny on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, <laughs> wherever you can find her as well. And definitely go to her website because that's where all the e-learning is. You don't even have to leave your home. Mm -hmm. You can just, you can take a course, sign up, do the full, I would do the full course. Why not? Just jump in. Uh, especially if you're curious, just get in there. Well, what, what I can do as well, if somebody wants to sign up, you know, through through this show, through your link, I will give you a discount code so that they can um, discount through your link. That is fantastic. Looking forward to seeing what's coming next. Certainly the retreats. I think we'll all be there. <laughs> um, thank you. And oh, thank you so much. It's been such a joy. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.